Okay, so welcome to the section on vacuum technology and the low pressure gauges and how you read them or high vacuum. And here is Sam Sana Mommas to tell us all about it. Good grief, I'm going to get rid of that guy. All right, so uh, we've done the kind of medium low vacuum gauges and you can actually have pressures that go all the way down to about 10 minus 10 tor that would be called ultra high vacuum and you find that in like surface science instruments and so forth so we know that the thermal conductivity gauges end at about 10 minus 3 so what are we going to do with the rest of it you need to do something else so you can't do the thermal conductivity anymore so we went to something which is based on ionizing whatever gas is there. So how's that done? Um, this is an ion gauge, um, or it's short for ionization gauge. And essentially it's not that much different from, for example, the ion source of a mass spectrometer. It makes ions. So how does it do that? Well, there is the filament. That's that little loopy thing there. So I could run a current through it and make it nice and hot so it starts to emit electrons. Now if I put my voltages the right way, this spirally thing here in the middle, that is called a grid. So I can set it all up so that the electrons that are coming off this filament are attracted to the grid. So, all right, they're going to fly in this but they're going to, all these electrons are going to be flying through this area in the middle. And then that wire going straight down, that thin wire in there, that's called the collector. And again, if I get my voltages right, I can set it all up in such a way that the electrons like to kind of circle around in this area and the ions will go, will be attracted to that central pin. Now, all I have to do is read the current through that pin and I know how many ions I have. If I know how many ions I have, that is related to how much gas there is in this area. Hence, um, you can figure out what the pressure is. Now, uh, what are the kind of parameters for this? Well, obviously, the more electrons I'm gonna have, the more ions I'm gonna get out of a, out of a given at a given pressure. Also, the bigger that that area is where the ionization happens, the more signal I'm going to get. So all of these gauges have what they call a sensitivity factor. Uh, and once you know that, you can take that into account with your meter. So this box here was intended to supply all the voltages and currents that this thing needs. Uh, and somewhere in here, ah, you see, this per tor thing here, this is where you would set the sensitivity for the particular gauge that you're using. Notice that the scale, it has a couple of different scales. There's one, one that goes from zero to 10. And then, you know, I get to choose my range here. So it's, you know, 10 minus three full scale, but that's a little bit of a pain in the butt. So people invented some electronics to do a logarithmic thing where 10 minus 10 is there and 10 minus three is there. So you'd have to put it on log if that's what you wanted to do. Um, note that the 10 minus three is roughly where the Piranis and thermocouple gauges and all that stuff. That's where that gives up. Why can't I go higher than that? Well, if you have too much air in this thing and you're running that hot filament, uh, there comes a point where you simply burn out the filament. And then you need another one of these. Um, you can often see if there are windows in a vacuum instrument, you can often see the glow of the filament of the ion gauge, which will tell you that it's actually still working. Um, 
Now, in those days, they called the negative part where the electrons come from, they called that the cathode, from the electron tube uh, era. Uh, so, this cathode is a filament, so they call it a hot cathode thing, which explains the name for the other way to do it, which is a cold cathode gauge or a penning gauge. So that says it's cold, which means it doesn't have a filament. So uh, how does it do it? Well, it does it in a different way. This is for a cold cathode gauge. If you ignore the two red ones here, because they're set points, this thing says it goes from 10 minus 3 to 10 minus 7. Then I go, wait a minute, wait a minute, my iron gauge went all the way down to 10 minus 10. Yes, and that is... You know, this kind of pressure is kind of the limit for a penny, which is why they're often used on mass spectrometers. The advantage is they don't have a filament, so you can't burn it out. So how does this work then? Um, completely different. Let's take a gauge head. Notice this one's from Edwards. Um, now I can take this out. <coughs> so that is just electronics from Crawley in Sussex. I'm sure Sharon's been to Crawley in Sussex. Quite a few times. Yeah. Uh, so that's just electronics. So let's put that aside. This is the actual gauge head. Now we're just going to take that apart. Mm. Let's see what's in it. So this is a flange you put it on your vacuum system with. So it, to me, if I look in here, it looks like a chamber with a pin in it. And if we take the thing out, then that's probably what we're gonna see. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's stuck in there, okay. Okay, there we go. Look at all the earth that came out of that. That is carbon. No, whatever it is. So, yeah, yeah. So this gauge is obviously used. So there's a central pin, and there's a chamber, and that's it. So the nice thing with these is they can be cleaned if you know what you're doing. Yes, you can clean this up and... Uh, I'm right. sure so iron gauges... That clean. is the model of simplicity. So how does this work then? Well, what you do is you put a magnet there's a magnet in here yeah it's quite strong and then you put a high voltage on that pin about 3000 volts or, or something like that now what happens the combination of that magnet and that high voltage is going to more or less set off a spontaneous discharge and what how how does this discharge work well you got to have something that you can ionize i.e the gas um, so this one just like that one works on the principle of ionizing the gas that's present um, that one does it with a filament this one does it with a magnet and a high voltage this one will go a little bit lower uh, well quite a bit lower in pressure but often this is good enough um, yeah, so uh, looking at this thing then, uh, see there is a oh, magnet in there. Yeah, perfect. Uh, <laughs> looking at this thing then, what's all of that? Well, what's in there is all the electronics to actually make the high voltage. So again, the current through it is indicative of the pressure. And you can see that it is more or less linear although it gets less linear down there. Um, it's not perfectly linear like this guy would be. Uh, you can actually draw up a mathematical equation which uh, describes the pressure versus the current you're going to get in that wire. Um, and that's, uh, is there anything else we should say here? So I've noticed that the new instruments that you started by, they very rarely have an iron gauge now. They have Yes, I have this tenons. is easier. Ah, yes, there's another advantage of the iron gauge. This one got dirty. You saw all the 
shape coming out. Right? Um, the, you, with an iron gauge, you can pull a trick if it gets dirty. Uh, you could, for example, run a current, fairly high current, through that grid spiral and just heat the whole thing up that way. So you could bake it out. If any kind of junk accumulated in here, you could bake this thing out uh, for a couple of hours and let it cool down and it would be clean again. So that's something that you cannot do over there. Um, what happens if this gets too dirty? Well, there comes a point where you won't get any more discharge. Um, in jargon, they say it won't strike anymore. So, okay, um, then it looks as if your pressure is great because that meter is sitting there. Uh, whereas in actual fact, this thing simply isn't working. Um, yeah, if you can get it to strike, it's going to indicate, but th that'll be the thing. So if, if your pinning doesn't work, uh, don't immediately point at the electronics for it. It's quite possible it's just dirty. I mean, clean it up if that helps. Well, great. Yeah. So around the lab, we have uh, a bunch of these tubes around. Um, so, you know, whenever one conks out, which is regularly, uh, take it off, put another one, and you can just plop the same electronics back on and uh, clean clean the one you took off, take it apart, clean it all up, put it in a drawer for the next time. And that is how it works. Thank you, Sandra.